Today's episode is brought to you by Herdacity. Herdacity is a nonprofit inspiring confidence in women to achieve their professional goals. For resources, networking opportunities, and a strong community of women, visit herdacity.org to learn more. Welcome to Herdacious, a podcast for audacious women. Hello, hello, hello. Thank you for tuning in to Herdacious, the podcast for audacious women looking to keep their groove in their career journey. I'm Lorelai, and today we're going to be discussing fashion and communication. We are going to learn to speak the language of clothes. To help me with this, I am joined by TV style expert, fashion stylist, and GQ insider, Miss Michelle Washington. Hello. Thank you for joining me today virtually, digitally, all the things. Oh, I'm glad to be here and I'm feeling fabulous. Excellent. Michelle, you are a fashion stylist and style expert. Why is clothing so important for women's career success and people's perceptions? Clothing is really a language. It's something that I had to learn on my own before you take that first step into any presentation, before you take that first step into an interview, it's something that speaks before you speak. So it is, in fact, a language. Sounds intimidating. (laughs) Yes, it can be. But uh, since I swim in the world of fashion, it's a language that I've had to learn to master. Excellent. Well, I'm glad we have a master joining us today. So talk to me about how we communicate through our clothing. Well, I'd like to call clothing the tale of two cities. It's color and shape. But most of all, clothing is really nonverbal communication. It can be just as powerful as speech, just as powerful as the communication that you'd normally have, because it's it can be a conversation starter. And at the same time, it's a part of a profound statement about yourself. A lot of times when people walk into a room, maybe you've noticed it and other people, whether they're in class and they're looking at a professor or there's an interview and they are looking at the next candidate. We have what I like to call the four second rule. In four seconds, believe it or not, A person has already formed an opinion about who you are based on the visual appeal and aesthetic of everything that you've chosen to wear at that very moment. Oh, my God. That is intimidating. Four seconds is our first impression. First impression. Four seconds. You better make it count, girl. That's all you got. Okay. So this is going to be an easy conversation, obviously. (laughs) Four seconds. (laughs) So talk to me a little bit more about how we send messages through our clothes. So if you're wearing blue, for example, blue establishes a color of trust, of calmness. It's actually the Pantone 2020 color of the year. For those of you who are not familiar with Pantone, it is the fashion color library that the fashion industry lives by in My goodness, there's about a thousand different shades of blue, but blue does set forth a medicinal feeling of calmness, of honesty, of trust. And it opens the perception of I can now communicate freely with this person. Wow. Just from the color blue. So just as blue is a trusting color, we will look at red, red in its most in-depth concentration. I I personally like a bluish tone red because it's more jewel tone. It is power. It is absolute power statement and it's also passionate and it is sensual. Sexy. (laughs) We, We do love a sexy color, especially think about a red lip. Now, when is that not sexy? Right. I actually heard that there's like a study that men technically pay longer attention to women in red clothes or red lipstick than they do women not in red. Oh, yeah. That's a heck of a signal. The lady in red. 
But it is a powerful statement. It's an attention grabber. And it's that try true. I'm powerful. I'm in the room. Pay attention to me. Color, which plays opposite of white. White is most definitely the absence of color. When we look at the history of white, uh, when the queens were reestablishing their economic status in the countries long ago in the English Tudor era, it was very expensive to achieve colors outside of white because it meant that people had to give up things that they needed, like old food. So when you're talking about achieving the color red, and I'm going to have to use rose petals and beets and certain concentrations of grape or a little bit of a shell color, all those are things that people need to survive. So it's digging into the agriculture and the economic culture just to achieve the color of red or any other color. But White is the absence thereof, and it's a fresh start, which is what it was meant to be before we westernized it with a meaning of purity for our wedding scenarios. Whoa, I had no idea. Yeah, lady, all the way. <laughs> That's incredible. All right, give me, give me another color example. Well, black is our color of sophistication. It is a palette so to speak. We use it as a presentation color. And most jewelry stores, before they adopted other presentation colors, you would always show something on a nice velvet black because the way that velvet reflects light and absorbs light. So the nap of the velvet fabric really is an absorbing color. And it is also rebellious, is where sophisticated. It also makes a statement It is a part of when Chanel first started the little black dress. And to tell you the truth, Chanel was a rebel at the heart of it. She wanted colors and silhouettes and most of all sophistication to be obtainable by other classes to thumb her nose at the rich. Oh, my. I love a good I love a good political statement in fashion. Chanel was definitely the one to make a political statement. Uh, She really felt that the World War eras were her her Zen period. That's when her label came to life. And it did start with the little black dress. So we have the sophistication, a little bit of power, very much so presentation. Think about that suit that men wear, the black suit, and they pair that with a tie. You concentrate on the color of the tie because black has set the canvas. Of sophistication. Absolutely. What about yellow? Oh, you've picked one of my favorites. So yellow is your energetic color. It has certain tones that make it feel a bit in the, let's say, feeling comfort, but mostly it is about being invigorated. It is about energy. It is about innovation. So yellow does have that reputation of being a happy color. So knowing some of these things about colors, and I'm sure we can do our homework to learn more about color meaning, how do we implement color messages in our wardrobe? The way I like to have people put the color in their wardrobe is slowly. A lot of people aren't used to color. A lot of people say, ah, oh, I wear black every day or I wear blue every day and that's good enough for me. And if it's not broke, don't fix it. And that's where you get into a rut. However, when you start implementing and pulling in small cues of color, it makes a world of difference. Going back to the example of men in ties, men have the perfect platform to start experimenting with color where whether it's a tie or a pocket square and then for women color blocking and we're talking about using the simple techniques of the color wheel well opposites primary contrasting colors i know it sounds a little bit simple but people may wear blue and red together for example a blue shirt and a red scarf 
And these things just play on each other in a color wheel perspective. Knowing a little more about color and the meaning behind it now, do color and shape when combined together matter as far as like outfits go? They actually can. A lot of times when you have a A A-line skirt, and that's more of a triangle sort of feel, depending on what you're wearing it with, the color that it is, it can either add to your look or it can take away. I really love the way that a nice hourglass silhouette looks for a simple black dress. Once again, if we're going to go back to the basics, it absolutely curves into the full shape in slimming figure or maybe not even slimming, but let's say it adds a visual appeal that makes your eyes go up and down without fail. Is that something that we want? Some people do. And I'd have to say that unless you're going to break up the way that you're dressing, like maybe a belt or you're going to tie a scarf or other around your neck or around your waist, then that's when you start breaking up the appeal of where the eye lands. And that's where separates come into play. Now, people can wear separates that are different color or a top that has a pattern that picks up on a color that's in a bottom. Okay, so all of this sounds really complex. And I know you are just scratching the surface of this. This information that you're sharing combined with kind of what we know about society tells us that the grooming rules for women are more complex, they're more expensive, and they're more time-consuming. Can you talk to us a little bit about the challenges that women face in regard to being mindful of fashion? Definitely. What happens is that the challenges have actually not changed through the years. We are still looking at different perspectives of expenses, something that we call now a grooming gap. And that's more centered around the look and appeal of our personal appearance, uh, hair, makeup, accessories, all those things. The time that it takes to build a look of value in your personal appearance can really just eat up our day. And tell you the truth, we all know how that feels. My goodness, in the morning when you're getting ready for work, how many of us are spending all our time in the mirror trying to fix this, that, or making our nail appointments, our hair appointments? And those are expenses that are not really built into our salaries and wages. And the grooming gap refers to the difference in time and price for the genders, male versus female, essentially, correct? Absolutely. For a majority of men, the grooming may be just as simple as a nice shave, the way you comb your hair, and picking out a nice outfit, and you're out the door. I I would love to do that. Oh, me too. (laughs) For a lot of us, it's a different thing. For myself, I'm hair product, I'm makeup. I'm choosing the right shade of lipstick, the right eyeshadow, the right blush. Then if you run out, you're like, okay, I spend on a particular brand. That particular brand has an expense that goes with that, depending on how you're spending. Everyone knows their different levels of their products and what it costs, but you're only making so much money if you're hourly. So now you have to consider, I make this much per hour, yet it is a part of my job to look a certain way. And the fact that my boss or patrons or clients or customers compliment me, that's great. I can only hope to get a raise so I can continue to buy the products to achieve that look that was a part of my job description of you must look this way, your nails must look this way, all those things. Those are a separate expense. And I think most females are familiar with this type of social norm that requires women to look more on point. Absolutely. And clearly, when going into this depth of 
attention to detail that women have to pay to their hair and their makeup and their clothes and their accessories and all the other things that go together to create a look for our personal brand, I feel like that must only negatively contribute to the financial gap that men and women experience in their career journey. Absolutely. It's something that I've experienced as I interview for different jobs at some point, or you have certain clients that you want to impress in a different way. The aesthetics are really not the same. Uh, In a client world, maybe you have someone that needs you to look a little bit more luxury oriented. A different client that has a different non-luxury aesthetic for their business, they may want you to tone down the way that you look. So you're, you're dealing with different aesthetics and different ways to please the client. And I'm sure that this is something that other people feel in their jobs when they're working the hour to hour. It's still a point that it affects their budget, even if your salary. When we're confronting the grooming gap, we're looking at a possible loss of 55 minutes grooming of prep time. Uh, For me, I'd have to say it's more than 55 minutes. (laughs) And this 55 minute number, that's specifically for women. That's like a a rough average for each day of, of personal prep. Oh my gosh. So about an hour a day of prep time for every time we want to go out to any sort of work experience, which means... On average, women have an extra work day built into just getting ready to go to work. Absolutely. 42% of the time, the products marketed to women are more expensive. So we're looking at another huge cut into the wage or hourly wage per se, as well as someone's salary. And they've budgeted for this, but they have to buy certain products just to achieve that look for that 55 minutes that we've been talking about. So almost half the products that are comparable between men and women, the ones for women are more expensive. But uh, that makes me think of the pink tax. That's what this is. This is the pink tax. I like the color pink, first of all. But yes, I'm going to say it's a part of that pink tax. Oh, it's, it's totally a thing. Tell me what meaning pink conveys. Oh, pink. So you've decided to choose the most controversial color of our decade. (laughs) Excellent. But with pink, pink is really more of a political statement at this time. Pink had the origins of defining our genders. And this was something that we stuck with the pink versus blue girl or boy. And really pink in choosing our gender as girl and blue is boy. That's another Western aspect that was adopted when it was actually the reverse. Pink was a color for boys when they were first born and blue was for girls. So once again, our Western culture changed that around. As we moved into the 80s, we started defining pink culturally and made it Oh, it's about being preppy. It's about being demure. Now, when we say preppy or demure, let's think about there's a lot of different shades of pink. But the fashion industry rescued pink from its social restrictions because we started using pink as a political statement, as campaign statements, as, well, let's look at the pink ribbon. When you see a pink ribbon, what do you think of? Cheerleading. (laughs) <laughs> breast cancer yes okay i get it now okay i was like what where do i see pink ribbons i don't know oh my gosh don't put me on the spot <laughs> that was a quiz no. <laughs> i failed pink does have a lot of different evolution periods and now pink has made it into more political statements but most of all pink is no longer demure it is no longer just feminine. The different shades, once again, give it its power. Hot pink, by far, is not demure or quiet. Oh, no, it's bold as brass. Yes. (laughs) So we're going to take a quick minute to move into a sponsor break. 
Hi, I'm Terry Broussard Williams, the founder of Movement Maker, an online platform that inspires the change maker in you to set the world afire. For the tools to find the fire within yourself and to build movements within your community, visit movementmakertribe.com. Let's be herdacious together. Thank you to our sponsor. And thank you, Michelle, for leading us through some really in-depth information on fashion. So I would like to ask you, where do women go from here? How do we start building out our wardrobe for success and in an affordable manner? I like to always start with investment pieces. A lot of people will go for fads and trends, and that's how you sink your money and you end up weeding out your wardrobe saying, I never wore that. Why did I ever buy this and that? Stick with the basics. Go for a shape like a pencil skirt or an A-line skirt or even a pleated skirt. Stick with those basics. Stick with a basic shift dress, but simple shapes that you can turn into something fabulous just for the use of accessories, a scarf, bold statement earrings, bold statement necklace, and color blocking. For example, going back to the red versus blue, blue top red skirt and some beautiful shoes. You can go with nude colors or as we always rely on black shoes, those work as well. But that's just an example. Don't invest in the fads, invest in complimentary stable, classic shapes, and use the fad and trend part in the accessories. That will update your wardrobe all the time. So I take it you're not a fan of the throwaway fashion? Fast fashion, throwaway fashion. It's about sustainability these days, and those are not sustainable to fashion and how we want to operate as a great fashion industry. Whole nother topic. Sure, sure. But it's also not sustainable for our, our pocketbook. So if we're spending portion of our pocketbook on fast fashion and it tears up in the laundry five washes later, we just what threw threw all our dollars away. Right. And so what you're saying is buy these more quality, sustainable pieces that we can mix and match and reuse for how many years could we get out of a, a piece of clothing? I have a shift dress. A blue one. I have had that thing for over five years. Every time someone sees it, it's different (laughs) because I put on a blazer. I put on a bold statement necklace. I've worn a scarf or I'm very much into brooches. I've covered it in brooches, all those things. But they're like, oh, my gosh, is that new? Where did you get that? It's about what you do with the accessories. A quality piece could last in your wardrobe between three to five years, a good quality investment piece. So when we're talking about quality, you're going to look for in the inside and outside of that piece. If we're talking about a shift dress, does it have lining? Is the lining tacked well? Does it have a fabric that peels or a nice suiting fabric? Things that men look for in a good suit is what women should look for in very durable outfits. Give us a few more examples of quality indicators for pieces of clothing. Fabric is a huge quality indicator. With your fabric, you want something that is not going to peel when it's washing with something else or something that you don't have to always send to the dry cleaners because that's a turn off as well when you're trying to save money with your wardrobe. You want to look for something that isn't going to have a huge bleeding, color bleed kind of factor. And what I mean by bleeding is that if I place that little red dress in a bowl of water, is it going to change the color of everything else? And that happens with black or blue as well. So you just have to be careful, read the care label It's a commitment. That's a contract to me as a fashion industry person. That care label is, do you commit to taking care of me this way? So ask yourself that. That's a great piece of advice. I would have never looked at a label and thought, this is the contract I need to uphold with this piece of clothing. But you're right. You know, if I spend X amount of dollars on a dry clean only dress, 
I'm not spending X amount of dollars on that dry cleaning dress. I'm also spending the dry cleaning bill every time I wear it. Well, the dry cleaner appreciates your business. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, making the world go round. All right. What's next? Tell me more. Well, we also want to look at things that have a lining. There are lots of fast fashion blazers and jackets out there because it's the hottest looking thing and it has a nice little patch at the elbow. But flip that baby on the inside out and ask yourself, where's the lining? Why am I looking at all the construction? How long is this going to last me? (laughs) These are things you want to ask about quality. For men, you want to take a good look at the shoulders of that suit. Is it puckering at the shoulder? Do you have something that looks like a muffin top? That's a bad, awful tailor job. You have to say next. (laughs) Michelle Waugh, I would love to listen to you tell me how to create a wardrobe every day of my life and pick out my clothes and my accessories. Most of us can't afford you. Um, Most of us don't have access to a stylist in general. So you are giving us a glimpse behind the curtain. So how do we do this on our own in a economical way? Well, I like the way you put that. This day and time has made it possible for us to have a lot of pre-styling options. There are certain websites of certain brands that have tabs to show you how they've been pre-styled, shoes, accessories, top, bottom, already put together, and you can take cues from that. There are also the subscription boxes, which a lot of people already belong to those subscriptions or they have heard of or wanted to try. This is a good time just to give a try to a subscription box to see if that pre-styling is really you. Do you think those pre-style subscription boxes are quality pieces of clothing? That is a very good question. I have actually run into a few of those subscription boxes that have a few good items. So you're not necessarily jeopardizing quality if you have the the right subscription company. And you can tell from there if you want to stay with it or not, or if you just want to pull in some other investment pieces from another brand. But don't give up on your closet. Don't give up on it all the way. Bring some of those pieces in Let them make friends. And you've got a new wardrobe. For those of us who might still have access to a store, depending on whatever shelter-in-place situation they got going on for them right now, uh, what stores are you a fan of that can give us some of these baseline wardrobe pieces that can help us set the stage for professional dress success? There are a few stores that... I actually have been surprised at the great size range that's available. Lots of people think, oh, I'm this size and they'll never carry anything from me. One label brand is The Reset. They carry letter sizing from extra small to extra large, and the cuts are pretty liberal. They are investment pieces, and let me tell you, it's that comfort fit that really mingles well with the other clothes, or as I like to say, they play well with others in my closet, as well as Banana Republic and Taylor. Locally, we have Amber Leaf, which they make beautiful clothes that are investment pieces in bold colors, as well as even lighter colors for each season that play well with others, because some of them are fit to you. They'll bring you in and say, okay, let's give you a one-on-one session. So this is just a couple of starters. And my last question, out of left field maybe, how do you feel about patterns, prints, and floral? Because we've only talked about colors, really. Patterns and prints, I'm not against them. They've been my friend at times. The enemy of any pattern in print is buying something too busy. And when I mean by busy, it's wearing you instead of you wearing it. Because when, <laughs> when I see a print coming at me and it's all these massive little paisleys just swimming around like amoebas on a shirt, I'm like, whoa, wait a minute, back up. 
a lot of times I'll suggest if a person wants to wear a pattern or a print, make sure that it's spaced out, that it's not too busy, that a person can recognize you. A lot of times I'll suggest if a person wants to wear a pattern or a print, make sure that it's spaced out, that it's not too busy, that a person can recognize you instead of your shirt's pattern being the object of attention. That's certainly not what you want. Excellent. Thank you for this incredible advice. This has been a great time to spend talking about fashion. Of course, it's my first love and I hope that I've helped someone to flesh out their wardrobe and to gain a new wardrobe from these tips. I hope so too. I hope all our listeners are able to take some constructive advice from this episode and really put it into play for long-term fashionable economic success through their career. Because if we're throwing away our hard-earned dollars on fast fashion or clothing items that are unsustainable for maintenance, I mean, the wage gap is big enough. We don't need to lean further into the grooming gap. So Michelle, we like to end our episode doing a femme fact, sharing some badass piece of women's history with our listeners. So I'm sure you have heard of the Pakistani activist Malala, right? Yes, very much so. Do you know what Malala's been up to these days? Other than being a, a badass? Oh, I, I mean, that's, I that's kind of enough, right? <laughs> That's actually uh, a lot, yes. Well, for those of you who need a quick crash course about Malala, here it is. Malala Yousafzai was born in 1997 in Mingora, Pakistan, where her parents ran a chain of public schools in the region. Malala was inspired by her father's humanitarian work in the education sector, and she began a blog at the age of 11 for the BBC Urdu, where she wrote of her life during the Taliban occupation. Her words and experiences quickly rose in popularity, and the following summer, Malala's life was the subject of a New York Times documentary about Pakistani military intervention in the region. However, in 2012, Malala's activism reaped some violent consequences when one day on a bus ride home, she was shot in the head by a member of the Taliban as retaliation for her outspoken support of girls' rights to an education. Two other girls were also shot on that bus. Miraculously, Malala survived and recovered. And despite the Taliban's threats of a second assassination attempt, she has continued her activism for the right for girls to have an education, all the while empowering girls to speak out and seek better opportunities for themselves. Since her recovery, Malala has spoken in front of incredible audiences and chambers that run the gamut, from the United Nations to Queen Elizabeth to Harvard, the Girls' Summit in London, the Women of the World Festival, the Canadian Parliament, and even on The Daily Show. At one point, She called out former President Barack Obama to his face for drone strikes in the Middle East. Malala is also a published author, having co-authored I Am Malala, an international bestseller. We Are Displaced, a New York Times bestseller, plus two illustrated children's books. As if her activist milestones and miraculous recovery didn't already make her a literal superheroine, Malala also became the youngest person in history at the time to receive the Nobel Peace Prize in 2014 for her struggle against the suppression of children and for children's rights to an education. She was 17 at the time. And the Nobel Prize isn't the half of it. She has an awards list that boggles the mind. Today, Malala works with education organizations in Pakistan to increase funding for girls' schooling. She's even started a fundraising initiative to have all Pakistani girls in school by 2030. Add that to her undergraduate enrollment at Oxford University's Lady Margaret Hall. Additionally, the Malala Fund, which she helped co-found, has been supporting the Black Lives Matter movement through the digital platform Assembly, which was created for young girls and women to share their stories so that women can learn from each other's experiences. Currently, Assembly is bringing to light the experiences of Black women, giving them a platform and a safe space to disclose any injustices that they faced in a society that otherwise tries to quiet their narratives. Although Malala's work has centered primarily around granting educational opportunity to women and girls, her ambitions unquestionably address the entire umbrella of human rights. Malala understands the inherent value within every person regardless of gender, inspiring so many others around the globe to do the same. As we are living in a particularly sensitive time when our society's history is being challenged for the better, 
we must remember to channel Malala's resilience and realize that we too are emblems of change. With compassion and a desire to redefine our futures, we can be the change we strive to see in the world. Michelle, I know that women can always use a little confidence boost and some support in regard to our wardrobe from time to time. And with the knowledge you shared with us today, I feel like you gave us a lot of what we need to make that happen. So thank you so much for your expertise and your passion for empowering women. Great to be here and thank you for having me. So I'm Lorelai and this was Herdacious. Personal recommendations to this show are so important to our success. So I ask for your support. If you're digging our show, please subscribe and please share Herdacious with a friend. Until next we meet, be the change you want to see in the world, both inside and out. Like I always say, a smile is always in style. Keep it fashionable. Nice.